You're listening to the Small and Supercharged podcast with Rhea Freeman, episode 191. Before you listen to today's podcast, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a heads up. This has got an explicit label with very good reason. Lucy talks about how she started and what she does now and a real turning point for her, which involved information she was told, which is honestly horrific. Um, It involved somebody dying, horrific violence against women, and it's told as it should be in graphic detail because it's important. However, if you are listening with small children in the car or if you are triggered by acts of violence against women I would recommend you maybe skip forward a little bit it comes in at around three minutes so maybe skip four to four or five if you're feeling like that which is completely fine obviously but I wanted to give you a bit of a warning because it's not just explicit someone swears it is definitely quite graphic but it's really eye-opening and enlightening and I learn a huge amount through the whole podcast and this is an important part of it I hope you really enjoyed today's episode and I'll leave you to listen take care on today's Small and Supercharged podcast, we're joined by the brilliant Lucy Griffiths, who, if you don't follow her on Instagram, you need to. Um, she has just released a new book called Make Money While You Sleep, but is also really well known for her content around visibility, getting on video and all these things we're going to talk about today. So thank you so much for joining us, Lucy. Thank you so much for having me. Excited. I've been reading your book. I said I'm I'm over halfway through it. It's brilliant. If you are thinking of, well, not even just making money while you sleep, because it covers all sorts of things which we're going to go into as well. It's not just about this passive, and I'm using the air the air quotes because passive income, I think it isn't it isn't a myth, but I think sometimes people think, well, it just means you do nothing. But as you've said in your book, actually it means you work really, really hard and then it repays you, but it's not quite sometimes what people think. But anyway, Lucy, can you tell us a bit about you? Because you've had a really interesting career. Okay, um, so I was um, I was a journalist for twenty plus years, um, and I started out kind of doing local radio, and I then I got to a point where I was interviewing some fairly big pop stars and celebrities, and I got sick of it I was I was kind of while I loved all the showbiz stuff um I just felt like there's something more and so I went traveling and ended up um working in various places which really shaped my personality and and my really my professional career so ended up in um Burma Myanmar now and got involved with um a group of women who had been, I mean, terrible story, they'd been tortured and persecuted by the soldiers, the Burmese soldiers. And um, this one woman told me the story of how she'd um, been gang raped and her daughter had also been raped. And they had basically, so the soldiers had gang raped her daughter and then stuck a cobra up her vagina sorry to be so gruesome and that had killed her and um and that was really um quite a pivotal turning point for me really in my sort of um life and and I just after that thought I I can't go back to um you know the way of working that I'd done before and so I stayed in um it was a refugee camp on the Thai Burma border and worked with um, training up Burmese, um, basically young people to go back into Burma and um, shoot video. And then from that, I got into international news and spent the next 20 years really covering. I was still very attached to Burma and would do lots of stories on Burma. And that was one of my, that was definitely a patch that I covered and would report extensively from there, but really covered um, a lot of Southeast Asia, um, was based in Bangkok and would fly across the region for whatever protest, earthquake, war, wow. tsunami, you know, going and would would cover those stories. Would still do the showbiz news. My bosses knew that. <laughs> so oh my gosh, that's quite diverse. <laughs> so they'd, they'd get me to go and do, you know, like a you know, if Angelina was adopting a baby, it was always me that was sent on that story or, um, you know, (laughs) 
so, but also uh, tsunamis I mean that's quite that's quite a, so, you know like Liz Hurley's wedding or when Jay Goody went to India or I was sent you know those kind of things I go and do but then also I'd be doing a lot of you know spent a good chunk of time in Afghanistan um and in North Korea um and then then in 2007 just ahead of um, the Beijing Olympics, I moved to China and then I spent five years in China, um, really doing a lot of reporting on human rights, but also covering everything else that was going on in the country and um, also in North Korea. Was it quite scary? I mean, I, not, not obviously not the showbiz stuff. I think I, I wouldn't be that scared of that. Although I imagine it is actually scary in a whole different way, but it sounds, yes. yeah. <laughs> it sounds obviously, really really important work because you're highlighting so many causes and so you know we need to know about the horrible things that happen outside of our little bubble um because it's really important but some of those places are are not are, are quite um what's the word volatile yeah I mean I certainly I've been detained more times than you know I, I've certainly um, I've been in prison in Burma. I've been detained in China. Um, oh, wow. Uh, I um, was, you know, definitely dodgy situations, whether that was in China, lots of very, um, the government is not a government to mess with. And um, I would definitely have situations where um, we'd be reporting and I was hacked, followed, um, staff were intimidated disappeared um you know sources would um we'd be worried for the safety of sources and then being imprisoned um I still worry about those sources from 10 plus years ago um Gosh. and um you know you you really when you talk to somebody when you're a journalist in China and particularly now more so than when I was there that when you talk to them, you are literally putting um, their life in danger by talking to them. That is, you know, one of the consequences of trying to report in a country like that. And so when we, you know, criticise journalists or whatever in this country or, you know, criticise the media, and I understand people have, you know, absolutely many valid concerns about the media, but actually there are many journalists really around the world who are trying just to just to tell stories that are really important stories that need to be told. And, um, you know, those were always this, the kind of stories that I focused on. Um, and yeah, there were definitely hairy moments that, um, that um, we would worry about our safety or, you know, members of my team would be, um, would be intimidated, their parents be intimidated or the family just for literally reporting a story. Um, you know, so yeah, you, you, there are places in the world where just by telling the truth and talking about publicly about what's going on and what politicians are up to can be life-threatening. Gosh, we are very, very lucky here in the UK really. I know that we have a lot to, that we moan about and and quite rightly we moan about as well but when you as in get, go beyond that bubble it's um we really are lucky that our, our moans are often not on the, anywhere near the same level as absolutely the no. real life <laughs> yes yes so um, I mean that's so, amazing and then so, what happened <laughs> um so basically then so after Asia I came out to the UK for a little bit and then I went to um I basically went to set up a TV station in Iraq and I did that. And while I was there, I was coaching Syrian refugees, basically. So there were Syrian refugees, Iraqi refugees, and they had obviously had completely different levels of trauma that was just off the scale. And so trying to work with them to set up the TV station, I realized that I had to find a different way of working with them. And because they'd been through such trauma, and at the same time, I was really interested in coaching. And so I decided to do a coaching master's while I was there. So I could literally take time out, 
go and do my studies, come back. And it was a really good place to study because I couldn't go out or do anything. And um, so, so I did my coaching masters while I was there. And then that was really the sort of pivotal moment where I started thinking about the online world and thinking, what can I do differently? And it had always been an idea that bubbled in my head. I had lots of friends in Asia who basically lived in beach huts and ran online businesses. So I knew this concept was possible. And um, so when uh, when my son was born, um, he's six now. So um, oh. and when <laughs> so so when my son was born, um, I had a really traumatic birth and. Um, terrible incontinence so it meant I couldn't go back to my old way of living I couldn't get on a plane and go and report in the same way and so I had to do something that was much more from home and so um, from that that's where I started my online business and sort of used those coaching skills plus my journalism background my tv background um, and sort of amalgamated all of those things together um, into creating an online business so there's a long story that involves. <laughs> no, it's it's really interesting though because I I knew about the obviously about your the, the traumatic birth you'd had and and that latest not latest because he's he's six with six six year old parents, um, but I didn't realise the depth of everything you'd done before, which is awesome and terrifying in equal measure. Um, I mean, how did you find it ha- having to make that decision to do something different when you'd had such a busy um exciting adrenaline fueled career and were you planning before you had your son were you planning when you had him you would return to some form of journalism or what was your original plan before you 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 had him um so yeah so definitely my life was full pelt and um it was really exciting and interesting but I also was quite burned out um so I was ready to do something different and I had seen other people um in the Libyan conflict I'd seen other people be pregnant and continue reporting and I didn't want that life I knew that once I had a child I did not want to be getting on a plane and leaving them behind and while I can admire people who do do it and I have friends who are still in that world who do it it was not for me and um So I definitely wanted to be around and do something different. Um, I also, I think I just got to the point of, I was frustrated with bad bosses and um, I was just office politics, all of that stuff. And a lot of the stories that I wanted to report on people didn't want to spend money on because they weren't necessarily I like the human rights stories I like the kind of stories that aren't necessarily that sexy you know I've been talking about the Uyghurs in China for probably 15 20 years and you know now the Uyghurs are kind of oh let's talk about the Uyghurs and it's sexy but you know I've been talking about them for a very long time and you know trying to fight to go and do that story and go and report on what was happening wasn't high on the priority list compared to um, going and reporting on Angelina adopting a baby. And so I would often find myself going off to do those stories rather than the stories I was passionate about. And um, it got to a point where I just was, I just didn't want to do that kind of journalism anymore. I still wanted to make a difference. And I realized that if I was gonna make a difference, I had to earn some loot and um, it was, um, and that was, I realized that actually when you earn money, you can be a force for good and you can reinvest that money back into other projects. And I realized that was how I was actually gonna be more powerful with my voice than simply being a cog in the machine. Sure. So you obviously had your son and you had the traumatic birth, which left you with fairly significant issues that meant you really had to pivot. I know you said you were planning to. Were you planning to do what you ultimately did or were you looking to do something slightly different? Um, I was. So when I gave birth and I and I couldn't go back to work, I was still 
I'd still said, oh, yes, I'll go back to work. And I was but I was still feeling pretty stuck about the whole thing. And um, I then. In the sort of in after afterwards, I remember meeting my boss and thinking, oh, I'll try and do this. And then thinking I can't possibly do this. <laughs> and so um, it sort of evolved. Um, I, I thought, I, I, you know, the coaching thing was definitely coming into play. Um, but I was I was pretty stuck and lost in the beginning. It took me a while to find my feet, definitely. So what was that journey like from thinking, right, I need to do something? And you've obviously got all the different elements there that now in hindsight we can look and go, well, of course, it's this. But what was the first step on, on your kind of self-employed running your own show journey? Oh, God. So for me, I started doing so I, I started sort of by working with other mums and doing coaching of other mums. OK. And I did that for I did that for a little bit, probably six months. And I realised that I had, you know, a year or two's experience of being a mum and I had 20 years experience in TV. And I was like, um, I think I'm missing a trick here. And so that was that was the moment where sometimes we and I say this to people all the time, I see it a lot. People might have done years as, let's say, an accountant and they have this huge bank of knowledge and expertise. And then they go and do they do a weekend course in flower arranging and suddenly think oh I'm going to create a course in flower arranging and I love flower arranging and they they sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater and ignore all that previous experience and while they might be bored of it and not passionate about it in the same way actually when you're doing it on your terms and talking about it on your terms it can become so much more interesting it's not necessarily that you completely dislike that subject it's just you've got to find a way to do it in a way that works for you that fulfills you and and all the you know you can when you're running your own business you can be more creative you can um you can you know have fun doing reels and all those things so you're still using your expertise and leveraging that but you can still be so much more creative and enjoy what you do And you don't need to feel stuck and pigeonholed in the same way that you did perhaps when you were in your career, uh, you know, in a cubicle reporting to a boss who was an idiot and all of that stuff that we have. Sure. And as you say, I think doing the work is very different to teaching how to do the work. Um, I know I, well, I'm PR and marketing and social media. And over the last probably three years, I've done a lot more kind of coaching slash mentoring because I was you know social media manager for a while and had a lot of accounts I was managing and just got a bit exhausted by it but teaching people is completely different because you get to like be creative and think of the ideas and work with them and you're part of like a team rather than you doing all the posting day in day out which is still important but as you say you evolve so it's not the same doing the stuff isn't the same as teaching the stuff yeah absolutely and um it just gives you that you know you just if, if you're in the if you're in the trenches doing all the time while there is obviously times where actually when you're doing it it is more powerful and there's definitely a potency to you doing something um also it you know it can become mundane and boring and and you want to step out and, and find a different way of working definitely so you moved into coaching you went from coaching mums to coaching connected to visibility um tv publicity and did that then lead you into creating these courses because you've got quite a suite of courses now haven't you so um so basically i was i was doing a lot of um coaching of um small business owners but also um like people within large corporations helping them be confident camera confident and improve their video skills and I was doing this and um, going out and doing various shoots for people doing video editing. And while that had, you know, it was great and it was bringing in money, but there was also a lot of outgoings as well. And so by the time you've done re-edits and what have you, you're in the doing phase. And by the time you've done that, and even though you think, oh, I've budgeted for this. And then if you're doing various re-edits, 
then suddenly you realize there's very little profit left in this. And so um, I was thinking, okay, I need to find another way of working, particularly, you know, with a demanding toddler. And so I, I built my first course, which is called Confident on Camera. And we, so I built that sort of automated system of selling that and began selling that, started using Facebook ads to sell that as well. And um, we've now sold over 50,000 courses. So it's, it's sold, you know, sells every day. Um, and that really gave me, you know, gave me a platform, gave me, um, you know, brought revenue into the business, made money while I slept. Um, and, um, and it meant that I could step away from having to be in the doing phase yeah. and then was on the back of that that built me an audience to then do more coaching and and then I began working with people because people saw the success of my courses I began more working with other brands and influencers um so people like Psychologies magazine I built their courses um and then other um influencers built their courses um, and so that was a way of, you know, so I was doing these joint ventures with people, but again, I was very much in the doing phase and, um, and I realized I didn't want to be doing. Um, and so sort of have stepped back from that a bit more, we still have them, but step back. And, um, and now it's very much just about building my personal brand. And, you know, th that's where last year the book came in, um, and teaching people how they can also, um, create courses so I now um, I have a program where you can learn how to um, build your own course but not just build the course it's also build the automation the structure so that you are selling again and again on repeat because that is the thing isn't it it's not just building the course in some ways is it's not the easy bit but it's the kind of exciting bit and the bit you want to do but it is making sure you've got those funnels that are leading people to you and you've done the course and you are exhausted from the course that it's still you're still promoting it and I think that's I know that's something I'm I'm guilty of um because there's so much other stuff that jumps in the way and when it's not kind of demanding you because you've done it and you've moved on but you the whole point is you did it so you could not be doing stuff all the time so you could be you know working on the next big idea and the big thing and doing these bigger projects but it is all the stuff that goes into it after you've kind of pressed publish, isn't it? It absolutely. And, and um, it is, it's about refining and tweaking. And um, I think Russell Brunson says, who kind of set up click funnels said you, um, you know, you don't want to stop working on your course till you have a million dollar course. And, and that's, so true it's the refining the tweaking of those sales pages optimizing working on it so that it really does sell and it's boring to do it I get that you know I was just thinking this morning that I needed to go and sort of analyze open rates of emails and go and <laughs> like stuff like that that doesn't appeal at all um it's not sexy it's not particularly like oh let's go look um <laughs> but it that's the stuff that makes the difference because when you look at that when you go and look at an email or you look at how your sales page is performing and if people are dropping off or people aren't opening that email you can say okay how can I improve the email do I need to change the headline do I what what do I need to change in order to ensure an open rate definitely so obviously you've got your course about courses, but you've also brought out a book, which I'm showing to the camera now, which you can't see on a podcast, um, called Make Money While You Sleep. It's available. I bought mine on Amazon. I bought mine on pre-order, actually, um, because, well, I like the subject, but it's also a thing of beauty. It's got spot gloss on the letters, and I do, I do like a bit of spot gloss. It's in your colours. It's beautiful. And it's really easy to read. If you're thinking about, it's, it's not, it's obviously about courses. It's actually about far more than that. Um, so can you talk about the book process? Because as I said, I have got a book which is currently with an editor and it's it's a journey, isn't it? And I have to say with my, with my book, I didn't find the writing that difficult. It's all the other stuff, a bit like the courses, actually. It's a bit of a... <laughs> so can you tell us how long has this been sort of in production? Is it a thought you've had for a long time? How did the book come about? Um, so I met 
with my agent Joe, literally March 2020, just it was probably my last time oh. I went on London Underground. I was living in London um, and met with Joe and told her my nugget of an idea, which was make money while you sleep. Um, and Joe said, oh, yes, yes, love it. And um, so um, she said, yeah, you know, really, I think I'm really excited about this, you know, crack on. And I said, yes, I will. And then I got COVID shortly afterwards. And then I was really ill and homeschooling and lockdowns and everything that I did not touch it for six months. I kind of just left it there. And we were in Italy that summer. Um, we managed to kind of go in the phase where you're allowed to go. And we basically, so we had two months in Italy and um, I would get up I'm an early bird and I get up at five and write. So I'd write for sort of an hour and then um, had um, the rest of the time off, which was lovely, but it meant that I got my, you know, two chapters done, um, three chapters for a proposal. And so was able to submit that. And um, so we had various back and forth, Joe and I. So it basically got submitted um, in January, 21. And um, the um, editor at um, Hodger and Stoughton, who published it, she, um, she basically read it and contacted Joe and said, I want this book, um, but I want her to write it in three months. And so, so Joe rang me and I think I was stood out, we were still in London, we were literally about to move to the Cotswolds. And I was stood, I'd just been, I think I'd just been for a walk on Hampstead Heath and I was, um, so, <laughs> and I was like, I'd stood at the door and I had freezing cold hands. It was like January and, um, oh, February by this point, sorry. And then um, said, and so basically said, um, yeah, can you, can you do this? And um, so I said, okay then, yes. So we were still in lockdown. And um, I waited until the schools reopened. So I basically, so by the time they kind of signed contracts and stuff, we were sort of end of February. And so I, and I had from end of February until the 7th of July to write the book. And so I, so it was two weeks of two weeks more of homeschooling. I thought, well, I'm not going to do anything while I'm still in homeschooling mode. I can't concentrate and so I waited and then I basically had 10 weeks to write the book so I wrote a chapter a week and um would James um James Clear's book Atomic Habits yes really good book. Um, was so helpful to me I would just go running listen to that and so he'd be like this voice in my head of kind of stopping me procrastinating and um going to raid the fridge I ate so many chocolate brownies um, <laughs> I, I, love that. I think I put on at least a stone and a half I don't know I don't I never weigh myself but I know that my clothes were really tight um, <laughs> so um and I just did it I just would get up early and if I hadn't done my chapter for the week I'd get to Friday and be like, oh, my God. And sometimes I'd sort of wake at 4 a.m. and think, oh, my God, I've not written my book. And I'd just go down and start writing. And once you get in the flow, actually, it's fine. Um, so I did it, got it in. Um, and then Bryony, my lovely editor, left. And so there was a few bumps in the road then. Um, and we were due to be published in September, um, but then there was a couple of bumps, not from my side, but from just the publishers. And then, um, uh, so it got pushed back to uh, December 30th. Um, and so, yeah, that was, um, that was really the process. Um, I loved the writing, definitely. Yeah, the other stuff afterwards is a bit tedious. Um, so, um, but I, yeah, I'm already percolating on book two because I really enjoyed the writing process. And, and I actually really enjoyed having that tight deadline because otherwise I know I would have faffed around for a year and like made a huge melodrama. But actually it was just like, okay, Lucy, you just got to get on with this. Just write it, do it. I hear you. So, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> but so this is your very first book and it's been incredibly well received, hasn't it? 
Yeah, I've been really, really lucky. Um, I don't think it's luck. Can I just put that out there? It's a really good book. <laughs> it's not <well>, luck. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I think the title is definitely a winning title. So I think that's really helped. Um, when I wrote the book, I really had this. So back when I was living in Thailand, I remember walking into Kino Kanaya bookstore in, in, which is like a big, huge bookstore in Bangkok um, and picking up the four hour work week. And um, this is like 2007. I'm reading this book and being like, I want this life. And while I don't want a four hour work week, I don't think that's actually, it's not something that appeals to me, actually. I want, um, I want to have passion and purpose in what I do. Um, I want to work in a way that works for me and it gives me that flexibility. And so definitely at the very heart of this book was, I wanted to sort of cling on to the coattails of Tim Ferriss and that possibility of being able to live life on your terms which is I remember him sort of talking about um you know learning to um salsa in Buenos Aires and and I and I want people to be able to have that freedom and flexibility I'm a more middle-aged version of writer than Tim Ferriss was so it could be about the travel but it could be just you just want to be able to care for an elderly relative or be there for your children or you know how in your retirement top up your pension but getting that freedom and flexibility so you can create life that works for you on your terms no absolutely and I think it's I think as well with the last nearly two years that we've had I feel like more people are thinking like that and really thinking about what is important and how they can get more of that in their lives as well absolutely I mean these last two years have been so hard for everyone. And um, and so, you know, it is, you know, maybe it's made us realise that actually life is for living and we, we want to squeeze every drop out of it and, you know, have time for our family, be there. Um, I was lucky enough during, um, during the lockdown because I was... Um, sick I was able to take a break even though I was a business owner I didn't you know I didn't post on social media I didn't do any anything for six months and I was able to recover and still my mini courses made money for me and so um you know that was that was a total safety net um so it can be that the courses are a safety net if you're in that kind of situation where you need to just for health reasons take a step back but also it's um, it also enables you to travel to do the things that you want to live and live life on your terms without kind of feeling stuck or chained to the either chained to the nine to five or chained to kind of your business where it's no longer fulfilling you no definitely one thing in this book and I think a lot of people who are listening may think as well is obviously confidence is such a big thing and getting on camera obviously you were used to it because you were a journalist you were reporting and there's something in this book I have I have marked it um where you put here about when you sort of set up your business and you were going to do your confidence was really really suffering and you said here um, I thought I was too old and past it I worried about my enormous eye bags my skin my radiation my radisha um I was petrified about what I think those old school friends I'd not spoken to in 20 years would think or if old colleagues would laugh at me I thought I was too fat would stumble over my words go red and people would laugh at me that I think that is just everybody isn't it we all are so critical of ourselves we can look at anyone else online I know I can I go and I'm listening to what they're saying and I'm interested in what they're talking about and then I look and I go whoa that wrinkle is bad today look at the state of your hair and will rip myself apart happily but I would never do that to anybody else how did you overcome that and you know god I we I think we we always are our own worst critics and I definitely can um you know spend a good hour going oh my god look at that or whatever um so but at the same time I think people actually want you to be real and authentic and um so 
in the beginning, it's really hard to put yourself out there. It's so hard to be visible. Um, but when you realize that you have a purpose, something bigger that you want to share with people, then that can sort of transcend the transcend the ego, transcend your kind of worries and the niggles. And you just push those gently to one side and say, you know what, I can do this. And the more you show up, the more you put yourself out there. It is, you know, confidence is a muscle. The more you exercise it, the easier it gets. And so the more that you get on camera, do those things, while it's really difficult, the more you do it, then the less you notice, oh, I'm doing that thing. I'm, I'm doing an Instagram reel or whatever it may be. And you may feel like a complete nincompoop in the beginning where you're like, what am I doing? Actually, if you, you know, if you consistently show up and do a Facebook Live or do an Instagram reel, then actually you will find it gets much easier. But you'll also notice that people resonate with you. They want to hear what you have to say. They want to see what you're up to. And you know, doing, being silly on, I love being silly on Instagram reels. Um, you know, I, for me personally, I actually get most of my business from LinkedIn, but I love the creativity of doing Instagram reels. So I will, I do them because I enjoy it. And so if you can kind of see it in those terms where you have fun, enjoy yourself, it makes your business more fun. And it means that you then, it's easier to do the other stuff. So find a way to make it fun for you. Also, I would say that although, you know, people always talk about Facebook, actually be really mindful of algorithms and algorithms, certain platforms, it's harder to get traction than other platforms. I will put the same post on Instagram, the same post on Facebook and the same post on LinkedIn. And I will probably get, I'll get, maybe a thousand views on a reel on, on, um, you know, maybe it's, you know, two, three, four, five thousand, but that's sort of around that, um, on Instagram. Whereas I might get 400 views on that post on Facebook and I'll get 20, 30, 40,000 on LinkedIn. So it's not just about creating the content. It's also about having a, applying that strategy to say, what platforms are going to magnify my message and so going with the platforms that are going to help you do that so that might be TikTok if you love kind of reels and that you know or that might be LinkedIn depending on which way you know what appeals to you um, but by being strategic plus matching it with your passion and, and having fun means that it's going to get seen by more people you're going to be more successful in what you do. Definitely. No, I couldn't agree more with that. And I think that's what we sometimes get. We look at the numbers and get not not transfixed on them because it is important to be aware. But the value of people on different platforms is different as well. Now, when we look at engagement rates, every every engagement is counted the same. But realistically, the thing that's going to add potentially a sale is if someone DMs you and asks you about a course rather than if they just double tap and like it. I think we've yes. got to look at the value of those people as well, haven't we? Absolutely. And I have to say, um, I've never, well, rarely had people who, maybe more now with the book, but rarely had people who will DM me and say, I want to buy your course on Instagram. As much as I love the platform, I get that regularly on LinkedIn. You know, so, it, you know, also in that way, being really focused to think where are business people if I'm selling two businesses where are they hanging out yeah. and so um, how can I build relationships and friendships on this platform to make it fun to make it something that's authentic ignoring all the spamminess building those friendships so that it becomes somewhere where it's it's you know it's a tangible platform that really can make a difference and improve your bottom line by having people message you saying I want to work with you definitely and I'm thinking about your whole sort of business journey I think people see the sort of shyness you know they see the lovely book they see that you've got loads and loads of sales but every business person I've ever spoken to have got those sort of highs and lows are there any sort of lows that sort of stand out for you 
and then even maybe what you learned from that we're going to do highs afterwards because you know it's all about balance but I just think it's important because I've had so many people listen and kind of go god I didn't know that about them and it just it inspires more sometimes in the highs because there's that journey there yeah I think um definitely with creating courses for other people so when I was doing a lot lot of the joint ventures um you know sometimes you're you know you're spending hours putting into a joint venture you're putting in you know you're basically building machine and the sales system and then you're reliant on somebody else to actually sell that is their audience that you're reliant on and when they don't necessarily match their side of the deal um that was a huge learning curve for me and you know I would certainly at times be like that could be really frustrating and um that was that was one of the moments where maybe kind of step back and say right okay I'm not doing this anymore in this because you, you're you're not necessarily in control of the messaging the IP um and so that those times were, were really hard I think also from a health perspective um when I was much more um kind of a, a, a more of a service-based business now I'm sort of selling digital products so it's easier um but I having lived in China for kind of five years my lungs are not what they were and so in the winter if I get a cough I literally am floored for six months oh, wow. and I can't shake off a cough um I have now found the cure I drink celery juice every morning and for two years I've not been ill thank goodness but but before that I was really seriously ill every winter and it would and what would happen is it would wreak havoc on my incontinence because I was coughing so much but also it would be really difficult for kind of doing Facebook lives for doing any kind of training because I'd be coughing or any kind of webinar. So it really had a massive impact on my bottom line. Mm. Um, and so that was, that was a major reason to try and automate the business and move away from all of that. But at the same time, when I did, I did have those times where people would sometimes say, I remember, you know, posting about this and being a bit upset and people being like, Oh, well, I wouldn't want to join a webinar if they're coughing. And it was like, like you doing it deliberately and, brilliant yeah really helpful <laughs> so, so you know those you know so when you are struggling if you're struggling with your health um you know that while you might feel like you're in the middle of the struggle and it's really hard um you know there are ways for you to build a business where you don't have to necessarily show up and be spangly all the time for the times when you don't feel spangly um and you can hide away and you know focus on your recovery and that's why writing like books or creating courses or building digital products about what you know gives you that freedom you've just got to automate the process so so that does the selling for you definitely and now we're going on to the highs, and I imagine there's quite a few good ones along your journey. Um. <laughs> you know, as I was saying that, and I looked at your face, and I thought, we're going to have one of these moments where it's like, um... <laughs> I know, that's like, okay, hi, oh, God. Um, <laughs> I'm, I guess publishing a book was, that was really good. <laughs> like she said, yeah, that's all right. It was something to do on a... <laughs> at the end of the year um, you know that was that was really good um <laughs> god um she says madly thinking of hi um uh yeah that was okay so I'll say um uh, being things like yeah things like that was definitely really exciting um uh <laughs> okay I, I I'm gonna go for one it must be really cool knowing obviously you've sold you know over 50,000 courses but not just having that as a sort of I've done this but thinking about the impact that those courses are having on those people's lives because not everyone's gonna do the course and go off and do their own courses but it's got the potential to literally change people's lives hasn't it yeah I mean that definitely I get some really lovely stories from people about how um you know they've how it's turned the business around and 
um, they've been able to, you know, put themselves out there, get more visible. Um, I have somebody who, um, she's she's in my membership who um, she is, so basically she works on the streets in New York. Um, she, she basically takes um, drug addicts off the streets and, oh. um, and puts them into rehab. Um, and so has, so she's kind of a, a church missionary and she, will um put them into um try and try and help them get clean and um she basically was so poor that she could barely the missionary no the mission should i say was not paying her rent so um she wanted to build an additional income stream that she could pay her rent anyway so she did this and what in working together actually she's now um I said, because she'd done it so successfully and she's, she's, you know, she's really tech savvy and she's, she's very wise. And she's now helping other kind of charities, organizations, church groups to automate their fundraising. And so she's teaching them how to automate their fundraising, do what they do. So what's happened is rather than having to go and raise money on the streets and going around, she's, she's fundraising through basically automating, so you, putting all the process of automation into practice to fundraise. She's just bought this huge house in Connecticut, um, which is like a 20 room, like sort of ramshackle house, which means that she can then get so many more women off the streets and get them clean in this house and have all, all these processes of automation so she can still work with them and provide the care but the automated systems are raising doing the fundraising for her that's really really cool that's amazing so that's a definite high so yes that's okay. a, that's a high <laughs> we is got there it's okay it's all good it's all good um is there anything else you would like to share before I ask you all the place we can find you and where people can buy your book? Um, I don't think so, no. I think we've had a good chat. <laughs> oh, I had a lovely time. And lots of tips for people to take away as well. I think all those confidence tips and just getting on and doing it, even if your inner voice is going, I shouldn't be doing this. I mean, that is it. That this is, this is something that anybody can do. So it's about sharing your knowledge, your expertise, whether it's you, um, you, you know, whether it's the flower arranging or you, you are really motivational. I have somebody who is 82 who um, has created a loneliness club just to share stories with other people. Um, you know, you don't have to be a particular age. Um, you know, he shows up and does tap dancing. Um, and <laughs> he's amazing. He's an icon. Um, Yes, totally, totally, really insp inspiring guy. Um, and so anybody can do this. It's possible for anyone to show up, share their knowledge, share their expertise, and create a um, digital course and a, you know and build that business that they love without sacrificing their family um, or you know and also living out their dreams, getting to do things they want to do like traveling more or just being with their family more and doing all those things they want to do definitely can you tell us all the places where we can find you online um so i'm lucygriffiths.com and so if you find me on instagram or linkedin or facebook i'm also dot com but it's lucy griffiths d-o-t-c-o-m um right. so that's that's how you can find me. Um, and the book is called Make Money While You Sleep. It's available on Amazon and also Audible. So if you like me, you like listening to a book where you're out walking or running, then there you go. Yes, I, I love an audio book. Have you done the voice? Have you read the audio book yourself? I've read the audio book, yes. Oh, wow. Oh, like I do love reading, but when I used to do more traveling in the car, an audiobook rather than like channel surfing on the radio because I am a devil for that an audiobook I would, would arrive somewhere feeling very inspired and educated which always was better that's I know that is the great thing the beauty of an audiobook isn't it yes so yeah I um I, I did it was 
four days of reading the book. Um, and I, I, it was funny because I thought, oh, I'll, I'll enjoy this. <laughs> but it was really hard. But I, it, I also loved the experience. So, but it was much, it was, it was much harder than I anticipated to to read because I thought, oh, I can read, I can do this. But actually, to read perfectly, and the the, the producer would be like, <clears throat> yeah, you maybe you said that sentence wrong. <laughs> so, oh. so. So if you do get the audio book, appreciate how much effort this took. But you know, definitely if you're even pondering, thinking about courses or showing up more or spreading your message more, I definitely recommend the book. It's a really good read. Thank you so much for joining me today, Lucy. I've had a lovely, lovely time and I'm sure people will check you out and the amazing book too. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you.